power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for our time to, to be in your presence. Thank you, Lord. We are aware that you are here, that you are among us. And I thank you for what's going to happen and what's going to take place over these next several days. Thank you for what you're going to do supernaturally in us, what you're going to do supernaturally through us. And, and I thank you that you are going to be laying the foundation that's going to cause us to experience your goodness and your faithfulness like we never have before. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give them a shout of praise. Worship team.
We serve a great God. Woo, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Hallelujah. Whatever you're in need of tonight that needs to be broken, you're in the right place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless his name. Come on.
Well, do you feel the chains falling? Hallelujah. Amen. No reason for anyone in this place tonight being bound by anything. Amen. The Son has set you free and you are free indeed. Everybody shout that it's free indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands and worship the Lord. Father, we worship you. We bless you. We welcome your presence in this place. Throughout this conference, we're expecting you to manifest your glory, your presence, your power, and your goodness in any manner that you desire. We are endeavoring to follow the instructions of the Lord Jesus. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added besides. We don't have to live like the rest of the world who seek things. We seek the kingdom and things are added to us. Hallelujah. So tonight as we begin this conference, we depend upon the Holy Spirit for leadership and direction. I thank you, Father, that he will give me utterance that I may open my mouth boldly. In the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare and I confess a spirit of accuracy on this service tonight in the delivery of your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that every heart will be receptive, be open to receive. We lay aside all of our preconceived ideas and we look to your word. We allow the word to be final authority in Jesus' mighty name and we give you praise for it. And just reach over and lay your hands on the person next to you and just pray in the spirit for them for a moment. You may not know what they're going through right now, but the Holy Spirit does, and he will help you pray the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we just pray in the spirit over every person in this auditorium, every person that's watching by live stream, in Jesus' name. Ola si probo la boca romande le bes e quero o doce brenendesti o sembro o stebre che un romancata e no mondo le chiese e nti bredele sto romande e le sto don am romando stita la bacchi in the name of Jesus your will be done in the life of every person your will be done in the life of every person in Jesus name burdens lifting, yokes being destroyed. In Jesus' name, we give you praise for it. Your word says, in the midst of our praise, the enemy is stopped and stilled. Satan, every, every assignment that you brought against every person in this auditorium and those watching, that assignment is broken by our praise to our, our God the mighty God, the good God, the God of power, the God of miracles. We give him praise in the mighty name of Jesus tonight. And we declare every assignment on our lives is broken right now in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against us shall prosper in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise for it. Come on, give the Lord your best shout right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I was going to say shake hands, but why don't you just hug somebody? Amen. We're in the household of faith. Hug somebody, tell them you love them, and you're glad they're here tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a few weeks ago when Justin informed me of the Lord's directions on this conference and asked if I would consider being a part of it. And I said, yes, I will. And so he and I together will, will endeavor to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in this meeting. And I want to thank all of you once again for coming out. I know it's cold outside. I know it's uh, forecast as rain, but you're putting first things first. Amen. You're putting the wisdom of God first place. And the book of Proverbs says when you do that, it'll promote you. 
So look at your neighbor and say, I'm headed for promotion. Praise God. So let's open our Bibles first of all tonight to Matthew chapter 6. This is the scripture that, that Pastor Justin has based this conference on. And um, I don't know what he's going to be saying. I haven't discussed with him what I'm going to be saying. So we're just going to follow the leading of the Lord in this. And I believe it's all going to turn out just right. Amen. Amen. I'll endeavor not to keep you too awfully long. I know you got children going to school tomorrow and got to get up and go to work and so forth. So let's just make the best of the time we have here tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, in order for you to understand the things that he's referring to, you have to go back and read some of the verses prior to this. And what he's talking about is the material necessities of life. The material necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, finances. All these things will be added to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, you don't have to spend all your time uh, pursuing those things. If you will devote the majority of your time seeking the kingdom, seeking his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. Praise God. So Jesus is talking about priorities, priorities. Now, I want to read it from the Amplified Version, and, and I want to uh, uh, actually deal with this session based on what the Amplified Bible says. If you have an Amplified Bible, you might want to join with me. And if not, I'm sure they'll put it on the screen and you can follow along with me. But seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, His kingdom and His righteousness. Then the Amplified defines that. His way of doing and being right. His way of doing and being right. Now, if you're taking notes, why don't you put that down? Seek first His way of doing and being right. And then it goes on to say, then all these things taken together will be given you besides. So notice in the Amplified, it says, strive after, first of all. Everybody say, first of all. So that's what the theme of this conference is, first things first. Now, strive after, that phrase would mean, put forth your greatest effort. Put forth your greatest effort to attain or accomplish what Jesus said we are to strive after. And one of the things mentioned in this verse, in the Amplified Version, that we are to strive after is His way of doing and being right. Say that with me. His way of doing and being right. Now, we need to understand what the word way literally means. So I've got several meanings here and uh, hope that you'll make note of them. A way or ways is defined as a method or methods, manner, style, habitual behavior, a customary mode of operation, strategy, systemated plan of action. Let me give them to you again. A way, when it says, seek first his way of doing and being right, a way is a method, a manner, a style, habitual behavior, customary mode of operation, strategy, systematic plan of action. Some of you may remember back in the 90s, uh, there was a youth minister in Michigan that began a movement with the phrase, what would Jesus do? How many of you remember that? It went all over the world. There were billboards all over the nation. What would Jesus do? In other words, implying uh, what, what would he do in this situation? What would be his way of doing? How would he approach this? So notice here, we're talking about seeking after, striving after his way of doing things. Now, how many of you believe if, if you were to discover his way of doing things, more than likely you'd live a successful lifestyle? Amen. I can't see anywhere in the word where Jesus failed at anything. Seek first his way of doing and being right. Okay. 
Now, going back to that, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, you won't have to turn there, but you may want to make a note of it. It says, Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live and that, you may, that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. So notice, if you will walk in his ways, then it will be well with you, and you will prolong your days. It's quite possible that you could live longer by pursuing the ways of God and learning how to apply them. Amen. I know for a fact <laughs> I've lived longer. How many of you can think of times in your life that you knew it was God that spared your life? Yeah. I've had it happen many times, particularly even before I was born again, before I surrendered my life to the Lord. Num numerous times, uh, if, if it had not been God, I would not be standing here right now. And then even after I came to the Lord, there have been times that uh, in the natural, uh, there was no way to make it through that alive, but God, hallelujah. So notice here, if you will pursue his ways, his way of doing things, then it will be well with you. How many of you want it to be well with you? And it's quite possible by pursuing his ways, you will prolong your life, hallelujah. Live longer than what other people thought you would or even longer than what you thought you would. You know, there are people, my, my grandfather, for instance, my dad's dad, uh, my grandfather told me I was the first grandchild on my father's side. And uh, my grandfather, he, he, he loved me. And, uh, you know, I don't know what it is about firstborns, but, you know, I guess they have special privileges. And uh, so I was the first grandchild on my, on my dad's side. And I remember when we were still living in Mississippi where I was born, uh, we left there when I was about six years old, moved to Shreveport, Louisiana. But I would go back to Vicksburg and spend a lot of my time off in school during the summer. And uh, my grandfather kept my horse there. I couldn't bring my horse with me. So my grandfather kept my horse there. And uh, as soon as I would get to the farm in Vicksburg, uh, when, I, when I got there, uh, I'd see my horse tied up out front by the porch. Grandma would have a wonderful meal prepared for me. I mean, country cooking. We, had a, we were self-contained on that farm. I mean, we had hogs, we had cattle, we had chickens, we had crops. We didn't have to go to the store for anything unless we just wanted to. And Grandma would cook some of the best meals you ever ate in your life. I feel sorry for people who were raised in the North. <laughs> I'm talking good food. And, and we had the sweetest corn on the cob you ever eat in your life. And I couldn't, you, they couldn't fill me up with it. And grandma knew that. And she'd make these fresh green beans and put new potatoes in it. And I, oh, I'd eat, I'd eat till I couldn't walk. And homemade yeast rolls. Oh my Lord, those rolls were good. Is anybody getting hungry? And it was so good. And I'd fill up. And as soon as I got through, I'd go out there and get on that horse. And we had back then about 70 acres. And I'd ride that entire property. And I wouldn't come back until dark. Now, I heard my grandfather say from the time I was a little boy, Son, I just hope to live to see you graduate from high school. And every time I was with my grandfather, he would say that to me. When I'd get ready to leave and go back to Shreveport. He'd say, son, I just hope to live to see you graduate from high school. I heard that all the time. I graduated from high school in May of 1964. And my grandfather came for my graduation. He was there. He lived to see me graduate. I started Louisiana Tech in September of that same year, 1964, from May to September. Okay. And the first week I was in college, my dad called me and said, your grandfather passed away. He lived to see me graduate. Now, I believe he could have lived longer. I believe he could have lived longer. He didn't know the power of words. I didn't know the power of words. 
But, you know, he didn't, he, he didn't die an old, old man. And he could have. But he just, you know, didn't know. He didn't know the things that, that you and I take for granted, that we've learned over the years. He didn't know about by his stripes we are healed. He's just a good Baptist man. He, he, he went to Calvary Baptist Church every Sunday. And if for some reason he, he didn't make it because he had to work in the field or something, on Monday morning there was a deacon at the house asking for Grandpa's tithe. <laughs> they sent deacons together at the tithe if, the, if you miss church. I wonder how many keep going to our church if we did that. Uh, I noticed you wasn't here Sunday. We've come for your tithe. But they did. In that little Baptist church, they did. I saw them do it. And Grandpa would have it ready. He was a tither. He believed in tithing, you know. And he told me, he said, that's how I made it through the depression, is I'm a tither, okay? And so, uh, but he, he, he only lived into his late 60s. That's not old enough to die. Now, my dad, he began having heart attacks in his late 50s. Now, my grandfather died of hardening of the arteries, heart disease, okay? And my dad, uh, he began having heart problems, heart disease in his late 50s. And while I was in Kenya one time, uh, I got up uh, one morning to go preach in a church in the bush uh, about eight hours outside of Nairobi. And uh, the Lord said to me, pray, your father's had a massive heart attack. Well, back in those days, I couldn't get back to Nairobi and, and just fly out because they only had two flights coming back to the UK. And then I'd have to take a flight from the UK back to uh, JFK, New York, Kennedy, and then one into DFW. So I couldn't just jump up and go get on a plane and fly home. I had to wait. They only, they only had flights coming back on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So this was Sunday morning. So I had to wait until Wednesday to get a flight to Nairobi and then to JFK and uh, to London and JFK and then DFW. And as soon as I walked in the door, Carolyn said, uh, your dad is in Florida visiting his younger brother, had a massive heart attack, he's in the hospital, and the doctor says he's not expected to live. So I got an airplane and I flew down to, to uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Went to Okeechobee where he was in the hospital. And when I walked in, I met the doctor. He took me in to the, uh, uh, into his office and showed me the x-rays of my dad's heart. He said, your dad's not going to leave this hospital. He will die before night fall. And uh, he said, uh, I'm sorry that I have to be the bearer of bad news. And I said, well, take me to my dad. So I went to my dad and I said, and of course he was all hooked up, everything, and just barely uh, aware of my presence. And, but when he saw me, he began crying. And I said, Dad, I've just spoken to the doctor. He said, you're not leaving this hospital. You will die tonight. And I said, that's what he says. And I've seen the x-rays, and based on the x-rays, it's, it's, it's true. However, it's not the highest form of reality that exists. Jesus said the Word of God is, is, is truth. And the definition of truth is the highest form of reality that exists. I said, so we've got a choice, Dad. We can either settle on what they say or we can settle on what God says. But it's your choice. I, I, can't, I can't do it for you. I can agree with you. And I hope you make the right choice because I don't believe it's time for you to die. And he, I said, so what do you want to do? He said, I don't want to die. I said, that's all I need to hear. So we prayed and laid hands on him and, and anointed him with oil. And I walked my father out of there and flew him home and he lived another 12, 15 years. Praise God. Amen. Now he would have died in his late fifties and Satan tried to kill him again several times in his sixties, you know, and he eventually just got tired and, and just didn't have the willpower to fight the good fight of faith anymore. And, and, and he died at 72 years old. That's too young to die. Amen. That's too young to die. And I, had, I learned way back in 1969 when I first was introduced to the ministry of Kenneth Hagin through Kenneth Copeland. Brother, Brother Copeland mentioned Kenneth Hagin all the time. 
And finally, Kenneth Hagin came to Tyler, Texas, and Carol and I went. And uh, he had about five or six little books on his table outside the auditorium. There was about nearly 100 people in that little auditorium in a hotel downtown Tyler. And when the service was over, uh, I went back to that table, and there was about five little mini books on, on the table there. And one of them was called Prayer That Brings Results. One was called How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. Another one was called Redeemed from the Curse. And, and, and I wanted those books, but I didn't have one down. They were 50 cents a piece. I didn't have 50 cents. I spent everything I had on gas to get to Tyler. And so I'm standing there looking at them, just drooling over them like a kid in a candy store. And the lady that went with us, she walked up there and saw me looking at them. She said, uh, Jerry, do you think we need those books? I said, oh, yes, we need these books. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll buy them. You study them and then you teach me what they say. I said, that's God. Buy them right now. You know. So in those little books, one of the things I learned that Kenneth Hagin said, based on Psalm 91, he said, the Bible says, with long life will I satisfy you. And then he said this, and my confession is, if you ever hear that I'm gone, it's because I was satisfied. But I'll not be satisfied until I have long life. So I said, that's a good confession. I'm going to start confessing that myself. So I started confessing then that I will outlive all of my ancestors. So I've already passed up my father. My mother died at 82. I'm 77. So I still got a few more years to catch up with mom. And I don't know if uh, my, 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 my grandmother on my dad's side, I believe she lived to be 87. Okay. So I'm, I plan to live if the Lord hadn't already come to at least 87 because I've been confessing all these years. I'm talking to 55 years that with long life, he satisfies me. And if you ever hear I'm gone, it's because I was satisfied. Hallelujah. But I'm not satisfied yet. Is anybody satisfied? So I still got a lot of living to do, praise God. Amen. So notice here that the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, that if you follow God's ways, you will prolong your days. Hallelujah. Then Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16. Once again, remember now, we're talking about uh, seek first His way of doing and being right. So we're talking about His way of doing. Deuteronomy 30, 16, love the Lord thy God, walk in his ways, and the Lord shall bless thee in the land. So notice, if you walk in God's ways, you can expect to be blessed by God. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, walk in his ways that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest. So let's go back and look over some of these things. Benefits of walking in God's ways. Number one, it'll be well with you. Number two, you will prolong your days. Number three, you'll live under God's blessings. Number four, you'll prosper in all that you do. No wonder Jesus admonished us to seek first His way of doing and being right. Why? It's profitable. Amen? It's very profitable, praise God. So that's what we're endeavoring to do, is seek His ways. His ways work. Can anybody say amen? amen? Now, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. There is a way that seemeth right. Now, I always like to add this. If there is a way that seemeth right, then there's got to be a way that is right. I'm tired of going ways that seem right. Has anybody ever gone a way that seemed right? Yeah. It seemed like it was, the, it was the thing to do at the time, and it turned out it didn't work at all. In fact, sometimes you wound up worse than you were before you went that way. There is a way that seems right. But if there is a way that seems right, then there is a way that is right. Amen. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 30 says, as for God, His way is perfect. His way is perfect. And the word perfect means without flaw. 
Absolutely no flaws in His way. Needing no improvement. So if we seek first His way, then His way is perfect. And that says to me, if His way is perfect, then I don't need to consider plan B. Because plan A, His way, will work. Amen? So, His way is perfect. Say it with me. His way is perfect. The psalmist, knowing this, made this statement. Psalm 25, verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. The message translation says, show me how you work. God, school me in your ways. Show me how you work. School me in your ways. You know, isn't that the reason why we go to school is to learn? You know, at four years old, I knew nothing about correct grammar. I knew nothing about punctuation. I certainly didn't know anything about algebra, but I went to school. And the purpose for me being in class, they said, was to learn. (laughs) Amen. They were schooling me. Now, if you don't show up for class in God's school, then whose fault is it you didn't learn anything? Notice the psalmist said, once again from the message translation, show me how you work. God, school me in your ways. In other words, uh, he's asking more than just Give me something to read. I want to know the ins and outs of it. I want to know the ins and outs. That's the reason when I was a young boy, uh, of course, my dad worked on hot rods and raced automobiles. And, and that's, that, was, that was born in me. And have, having a dad that that's what he did, you had it made. You know, speed was a big part of our life. And I'm not talking drugs. I'm talking horsepower. <laughs> You want to know about that speed called <laughs> drugs? You'd have to ask Jesse to plant. I don't know anything about that, okay? But he took trips right in his living room. He took trips all over the world and never left his living room. Okay? But, but speed and horsepower and fast was a part of my life, all my life, all my young life. And, and at about nine years old, I said, Dad, I want you to teach me. Because what, what my dad didn't know about working on cars, I don't think they'd invented yet. And he not only did paint and body work, and, and he had the reputation in our city as being one of the best. And now, because I'm his son, I knew if he schooled me in this, I'd be learning from one of the best. Amen. And my dad said to me, when he started teaching me at about nine years old, he said, now son, if you're going to start looking for shortcuts, shortcuts, I'm not, going, I'm not going to take you any further. And then back then, uh, you know, uh, doing body work, you used lead. Bondo wasn't, wasn't introduced yet. Okay, that came later. But you used lead. You had to learn how to use lead paddles. You had to learn how to heat and shrink and peck and file. And it's a process. It takes a whole lot longer than working Bondo. Okay. And so that's how dad taught me. In fact, he said to me when Bondo came out, he said, if I ever catch you using Bondo, I'll whip you, boy. (laughs) Well, eventually I went to work for dealerships, some of the same dealerships my dad had worked for when I was a young boy. And when I when I unloaded my snap on tool chest and set it up in my stall, I set out my lead paddles. I set out all the all the tools that I needed to to work on this quarter panel and so forth. And some of the other body men came over and said, what is that? I said, what? They said, those paddles. I said, lead paddles. Well, what are they for? I said, spreading lead. We don't use lead here. We use Bondo. And, it, and I went to the body shop foreman. I said, you don't, you don't use lead here? He said, no. Uh, Lead has become too expensive, so we've gone to Bondo. 
So I had to learn how to use Bondo. And it's an art. I taught my wife. <laughs> she, can, she can spot a car right now going down the road and tell if it's ever had Bondo in it or not. And your hands become so sensitive. Now my hands are not that sensitive anymore because I, I don't do that. But there was a time my hands were so sensitive that I could, I could just run them across a, a quarter panel or a fender and feel any kind of ripple or, or, or dip or anything. And, and I learned how uh, to, to become a specialist with Bondo. We, we had a, a nickname for it. Uh, Jerry has become an art gum specialist. That's what they called Bondo, art gum. And so anyway, uh, I had to learn. And not only did I learn from my dad, but they had classes from time to time. General Motors, if I was, most of the time I worked for General Motors, and General Motors would have classes that you could go to. And I was being schooled in new uh, methods. And they were introducing to us new tools that would help us do the job faster and better. So I was being schooled. Not only that, but I bought magazines, Hot Rod magazines. I lived with Hot Rod magazines. And, and I'm always looking and reading about how to make this thing faster. And I found out if I did what they said do, it worked. If they said you can increase the horsepower by 20% by doing this, and I did it, it worked. James tells us, be a doer of the Word. And not a hearer only. Why? Because it works for doers. So I was being schooled in the profession that I had chosen and, and that, you know, that, that I was uh, making a living as until I went into the ministry. And I know nothing about the things I'm teaching you tonight. I knew none of this. I, I didn't even know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the same story. I'll tell you how ignorant I was. Would you like to hear how ignorant I was? I read in James one time. I was only about three months on the old in the Lord. Divers temptations. Divers temptations. I went into the bedroom where Carolyn was. I said, Carolyn, did you know there were, there were divers back in Jesus' day? Because I had, I had scuba dived in college. My roommate was a scuba diver, and, and I went and learned how to scuba dive. And he and I would go diving, and, and that's what I thought he was talking about. Diver's temptations. I had been tempted while I was diving one time. <laughs> going too deep, you know. I mean, one time we went diving in a, in a, in a, a lake right outside of Minden, Louisiana. And while we were down there, we found a cash register. And we brought it out and, of course, opened it to check and see if anything was in it. There was not anything in it, so we thought, well, we'll do it. Let's take it to the sheriff's department. And we took it to the sheriff's department, and they told us uh, there, was a, there was a service station robbed last night, and this is the cash register out of that service station. And the people took all the money out and threw it in that lake, and we found it and got a reward. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Divers temptations. <laughs> Don't go off and tell anybody that. Okay. But that's how ignorant I was when it came to the knowledge of God's Word, but I got in school. Yeah. And my school, to start with, to learn the Word, were reel-to-reel -reel tapes yeah. and books <clears throat> by men who knew more about it than I did. Yeah. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne. Those were my first four mentors. Amen. <clears throat> and thank God they had resources that I could study and I was being schooled and I could not get enough. I, 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 it was like treasure to me. I had no idea this book contained such wisdom, such nuggets, and I couldn't get enough of it. And I'm being schooled. And as I'm being schooled in the ways of God, I noticed my life was changing. Everything around me was changing. Hallelujah. That's one of the things that you can expect when you seek first 
his way of doing and being right. Okay? So notice in Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. It has no flaws and it needs no improvement. The psalmist said, show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. The message translation once again says, show me how you work, God. Show me or school me in your ways. So let me ask you this question. Would you agree with me that if you could learn God's way of doing things and learn how to apply them, then you could expect your life to be a whole lot better? Amen. No wonder Jesus said, Make this a priority. And isn't it amazing how many Christians, they're in need of everything Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6. The material necessities of life. But they'll go about trying to acquire them every way but the way he said go for it. Seek first his way of doing things and his way of being right. They'll They'll go about it every other way other than allowing God to school them in His ways. But brothers, I don't have time for that. Isn't it amazing? The creator of the universe did not create enough time for you. 16 billion miles of universe with these words, light be, and 16 billion miles of universe came into existence, but He forgot to make more time for you. Could it be maybe you're not managing your time? Oh, God forbid. It'd be your fault. (laughs) Amen. We don't manage our time. And we don't think like he thinks until we get in his ways and learn to think like he thinks. And his, his solution, his strategy for every need being fulfilled in your life is seek first. Make it priority, my way of doing and being right. Amen? Now, in uh, Psalm 103 in verse 7, it says, He made known His ways unto Moses and His acts unto the children of Israel. He made known His ways. In other words, He schooled Moses in His ways. Remember when Moses came up on that burning bush and he was led aside and God began then teaching him his ways. And all the way through that that situation, he was teaching him his ways. All the way through uh, him raising Moses up to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was schooling him in his ways. Now, notice it says, he made his... He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. They didn't know God's ways. They could only see his acts. And his acts were a byproduct of his ways. When you do things the way God does them, then you see things happen. He confirms it with signs following. I I don't want to just know about his acts. I want to know how he does it. It's like I told my dad that time. My dad would, he'd say, no, son, I want to I show you uh, how to work on this quarter panel. And then he'd start working on it. And I'm sitting there and he'd finish the job. I say, dad, I, I didn't learn anything. You said you was going to teach me how to do this. But you did it. So I saw my dad's acts. But I wanted to know his ways. I wanted to know how he did it. Amen. I've seen God's acts. I've seen God's miraculous power and ability. But I like to be an insider. I want to know how He does it and why He does it. Amen? Does anybody, uh, you know, uh, have this kind of mindset where you just want to know how things work? Have you ever broke something down? Just to see how it worked, then you couldn't put it back together. <laughs> when I first went to work with Brother Copeland, he had a little office, actually his, grand, his, his father's office on Berry Street. Just a little small office. 
It had uh, Brother A.W., Brother Copeland's dad's office, one secretary, and Brother Copeland's office, a bathroom, and a hallway. Okay, that was, that was the size of the office that Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association began in. And when I came to work, my office became the hallway. I built shelves in there and set up tape duplicators. And I'm running tapes. If anybody had to go to the bathroom, I had to leave my office because there was not enough room to go down the hallway to get to the bathroom with me standing there. Okay? So, uh, one day, Brother Copeland said, Jerry, uh, I want us to stay over tonight. Uh, after, after, I want us to stay over even after work. He said, this copy machine is not, it's not working properly. He said, let's, let's take it apart and, and see what's wrong. Well, I've never worked on a copy machine in my life. Z Xerox, is that what he was? I don't know anything about a copy machine, and neither did he. <laughs> but he was very meticulous. Oh, I'll never forget as long as I, I see it right now. He took the, the top off of it, took the screws out, took the top off of it. And then he took the, the walls off of it. And then he started uh, undoing this. And he made labels for everything and laid it down here and, and wrote on that label where it went. And, and everything, I mean, everything. He had, he had parts laying everywhere with labels on them. And then he got tired of fooling with it and said, I'm going home, put it back together. And see if you can find out why it's not copying. Thanks a lot. I don't know what I'm doing here. And just before he left, he walked over to me and said, you have the mind of Christ, in Jesus' name. That's what he did to me. Every time he had me do something, he didn't know what to do. You have the mind of Christ. And if I didn't do it right, ding-a-ling. <laughs> that was my nickname, ding-a-ling. <laughs> so anyway... I called Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, don't expect me home tonight. I don't know when I'll get home. I got this copier to put back together, and I don't know the first thing I'm doing with this copier. So I just looked at all them parts, and I put it where I thought it went. I put it where I thought it went. I hooked up this, and I hooked up that, and I put the cover back on it, and then I plugged it in, and then I turned it on, and I tried to make a copy, and it worked. Then I looked around me and I had parts left over. <laughs> Brother Copeland came in the next morning and said, did you get that copier fixed? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, what was wrong with it? I said, the manufacturer put too many parts in it. <laughs> <laughs> but what my point is, you, you, get, into, you get into something and you're, you're intrigued with it and you want to know why it works. What makes it work? What makes it tick? His brother Copeland's mother told me one time, I could not leave an alarm clock or a clock or a radio in Kenneth's room when he was a young boy. She said he'd get in bed and he, couldn't, he just couldn't stand it. He'd look over at that clock or that radio and he just couldn't stand it. He wanted to know what, what made it work. And he'd take it apart. And the next morning I'd come in his room and there's parts laying everywhere. He, would, he was good at taking it apart, but he wasn't too good at putting it back together. <laughs> now, he's Kenneth Copeland's a different man today, okay? That guy's brilliant doing things, you know? And anyway, uh, I want to know. I, I don't, don't want to just read. And like we sang tonight, you know, God can heal. Uh, he, can, he can heal the blind. I want to read that, and I want to know that, but I don't want to know how he does it. I want to know the ins and the outs. I want to know if the Bible says, and the believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I want to know how to do that. Amen. And so I began studying that way back there a long time ago, and learned how to appropriate that spiritual law. And I've had many people healed all over the world as a result of it. But I'm not satisfied with just reading about it. I want to know how to do it. I want to know His ways. Moses knew His ways. 
The children of Israel knew only his acts. So if he made known his ways to Moses, then don't you think that he would be willing to make known his ways to you and me? After all, you're born again. Moses wasn't. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. Moses wasn't. You're a New Testament believer. Moses wasn't. So why would God show Moses his ways and not show his ways to you and me? Amen. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, praying for the body of Christ. We read it this morning, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The Passion Translation says, make you a reservoir of wisdom. Make you a reservoir of wisdom. Hallelujah. A reservoir of wisdom. Say that. God wants to make me a reservoir of wisdom. Hallelujah. Didn't that, doesn't that sound good? So if, if He wants us to increase in the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, then I believe that would include knowing His way of doing things. One translation adds this statement to that verse, that your efforts will be productive. When you are filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and understanding, you know His ways, then you will be, your efforts will be productive. Is anyone interested in their efforts being productive? Amen. So far we've learned this. If we strive to seek His ways and to do so with great effort, knowing that His ways are perfect and without flaw, and once He shows us His ways, we learn to apply them, then we can be confident that our efforts will be productive. I got that out of connecting all those verses. Can I read it again? If we strive to seek His ways and to do so with great effort, knowing that His ways are perfect and without flaw, and once He shows us His ways and we apply them, then we can be confident that our efforts will be productive. Hallelujah. That's the result of putting first, seeking first, His way of doing and His way of being right. Can anybody agree with me that you can expect those kind of results? Yes. Amen. Amen? Now, let's define ways once again, just so you, I know you didn't forget. Ways, method, manner, style, habitual behavior, customary mode of operation, strategies, systematic plan of action. So Jesus is telling us, seek first God's way, and you can add all those definitions, God's method, God's manner, God's style, God's habitual behavior, God's customary mode of operation, strategy, systematic plan of action, and then all these other things will be added to you. If you put God's ways of doing and being right first place in your life. Make it priority. Hallelujah. And I want to challenge everyone in here tonight to begin to approach this in the same manner that the psalmist did. And the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will meditate in all thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Meditate is more than just reading. Meditate is more than just hearing about them in church. To meditate is to dwell on them. To run them over and over in your mind and in your spirit. Amen. Constantly thinking about it. Constantly thinking about it. The message translation says, I delight far more in what you tell me about living than in gathering a pile of riches. He goes on to say, let me get my glasses out where I can read my own handwriting. It's really small. I added this note. He goes on to say, I actively 
Watch how you have done it. I won't forget a word of it. Hallelujah. I actively watch how you have done it, and I won't forget a word of it. Amen. The Amplified Bible refers to His ways in this verse as your paths of life. So we could say the paths that will produce our best life. If we learn God's way, God's path, God's method, God's strategy, then it will produce our best life. The Passion Translation says, I set my heart on your precepts and pay close attention to all your ways. And notice back up there in the King James, I have respect under your ways. And the phrase I have respect under your ways literally means I will look steadfastly to your ways and look away from all else. I will look steadfastly to your ways and look away from all else. Steadfastly means with fixed attention. With fixed attention. Amen. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 128 verse 1, Blessed is everyone that walketh in his ways. When you have fixed attention on his ways... You have given them priority in your life. Then the Bible says, blessed is everyone that walketh in his ways. And we've learned that to be blessed means to be empowered to prosper, to be empowered to increase. Amen. And verse 2 says in Psalm 128 verse 1, your reward will be prosperity, happiness, and well-being. Your reward will be happiness, prosperity, and well-being. So God is telling us that when we choose to put His way of doing and being right first place in our lives, then we will begin to enjoy life at its best. Somebody give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Amen. Now, Proverbs chapter 8, Solomon makes this statement. He repeats the, the statement that we found in Psalm 128. In Proverbs 8, 32, blessed are they that keep my ways. Blessed are they that keep my ways. And the Passion Translation says this, nothing will bring you more joy than following my ways. Nothing will bring you more joy than following my ways. Somebody say amen to that. Now, let me go back to a little uh, note that I wrote just before coming over here. If you want to know God's ways, how many of you really want to know God's ways? Would you suppose that you probably could find them beginning in chapter 1 of Genesis chapter 1? Amen? I mean, that's the book of beginning. Surely we could find God's way of doing things in the book of beginning. Okay, go there with me for a moment. Genesis chapter 1. Right after God made man, verse 28 said He blessed them, told them to be fruitful and multiply, replenish, have dominion. Then verse 29, And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And the word meat can also be uh, translated as provision. So what is God saying? Here is how you will have your life sustained while you're on the earth. I will give you seed. I'm providing seed. And what is seed for? Seed is for sowing. Seed is not for eating. Seed is for sowing. Amen. Amen. What farmer goes and buys seeds and then eats them? He buys seeds to sow them. Amen. Why? For provision. So God is teaching Adam from the very beginning his way. And God's way is sowing. God operates on the principle of sowing and reaping. And so does his kingdom. You'll find it. In Mark chapter 4, where Jesus said, 
And so is the kingdom of God likened to a man who went out and sowed seed. So what's he saying? Here's what the kingdom of God is, is like. Here's how the kingdom of God functions. Here's how the kingdom of God operates. Here's how God operates. Amen? So notice here, he's giving Adam at the very beginning the way of God for having your life sustained. Sowing seed. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And that has not changed. Even when Adam and Eve blew it, that, that spiritual law did not change. Uh, uh, God started all over with Noah. And, and after the flood, God said to Noah, Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth, uh, Genesis 22, 8, as long as, Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Is the earth still here? Yes. Then it's still God's way. Seed time and harvest shall not cease. Amen. And you'll notice that once again, Jesus taught in the fourth chapter of Mark about the sower sows the word. And he made this statement. If you don't understand this parable, how can you understand any parable? And he was talking about sowing and reaping. He said, if you don't understand the principle of sowing and reaping, you're not going to get very far in kingdom principles. Amen. I've, I've been asked many times in different places all over the world. Uh, what is the greatest spiritual law you've ever learned? I don't hesitate. The law of seed time and harvest. That's the greatest spiritual law I have ever learned. That's the law that got me out of debt. That's the law that, that, that got me uh, every need in my life met. That's the law that enabled me to prosper. That's the law that enabled me to be blessed and the law that enabled me to be a blessing. Hallelujah. The law of seed, time, and harvest. Everything I have, everything I own, everything this ministry has, everything it owns came by the law of seed, time, and harvest. Amen. The law of seed, time, and harvest. And that law will never become invalid. As long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. It was God's way in the beginning. And it's still God's way today. Can you say amen? amen? Now, remember where we read that God uh, showed his ways unto Moses, or he made known his ways unto Moses and his acts to the children of men or the children of God? Let's go to the book of Exodus for a moment. And I'll just, I'll just read some verses here. You can follow along if you want to. Beginning in verse 18, chapter 18, rather. Verses 19 and 20. Be thou, this is what, this is what Jethro said. This is Moses' father-in-law. This is what Jethro said to Moses after Moses told him all the great things God had done in delivering the children of Israel out of bondage, rehearsing those things. Then Jethro said this, Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes, their causes unto God. The Amplified kind of unscrambles that and says, You shall represent the people before God, bringing their cases and causes to Him. And then it goes on to say, And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws. You shall teach them ordinances and laws. That... Or, you shall teach them ordinances and laws, and thou shalt show them the way. Have you got that up there? You shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. So when God showed Moses his ways, then his job was to teach him to the people. The message translation says, your job is to show them how to live and what to do. Your job is to show them how to live and what to do. Later, call, uh, Moses calls, uh, God calls Moses up on Mount Sinai, and he spends 40 days and 40 nights with him, teaching him laws and ordinances. My goodness. 
40 days and 40 nights being schooled by God. My goodness, can you imagine that? Being schooled by God. And then when Moses was allowed to depart, his assignment was to teach these laws and ordinances to the people and to teach them how to live by God's ways. And that's in Exodus chapter 24 and about verse 12 through 18. Then he told him about the assignment that he was giving the people. Now, you would think after Moses came down off of that mountain, after spending 40 days and 40 nights being schooled by God in laws and ordinances, that it would have taken Moses at least twice that time to cover all that material. You know. And you would have thought that the first thing he would have started was those laws and ordinances. Sit down, folks. Here's law number one. Sit down, folks. Here's law number two. In a few moments, several days from now, we'll get to the ordinances. That's not what happened. In fact, look at this. Exodus 25 and verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Now, don't you know that upset some of those people? You mean to tell me you spent 40 days in the presence of God and you come back and receive an offering? That's just like a preacher. That's what God told him to do. Go back and speak to the people and tell them to bring an offering. Every man that will give it willingly with his heart. The message translation says, they are to set aside offerings for me, receive the offerings from everyone who is willing to give. And then in verse 8, God says this from the message translation. Let them construct a sanctuary for me so that I can live among them. Let them construct a sanctuary for me so that I can live among them. And notice before the assignment came, seeds were sown. Why? Because that's God's way. If you're gonna if you're gonna seek first the kingdom of God, his way of doing and being right, at some point you're gonna discover that God's way is seed time and harvest. God's way is seed time and harvest. God has, I'm gonna get this need met. You've you've probably heard me tell this story, and I'll tell it just as quickly as I can. I was flying to uh, Tulsa to do a meeting with Brother Roberts at the Maybe Center. And on the way up there, uh, I was praying about uh, the work we were doing in, in the nation of Kenya. We were building a medical facility. And uh, I had run out of money. I was paying cash as I did it. And I didn't have any more money to invest in it. And we still had uh, things that we needed to do. And, and uh, I had money that was designated for other projects, but I couldn't use it because... That's what the IRS considers as misappropriating funds. So I didn't have any more money designated for this project in that medical facility in Kenya. So on the way up there, I said, Lord, I need X amount of dollars to finish this project. And he said, when you get to Tulsa, there'll be five ministers who are contemplating leaving the ministry. Call them up at the end of your service. And lay your hands on them and tell them you're going to invest in them one of your suits in each one of them. Now I asked God to supply a need and he's telling me to sow a seed. I said, okay. So we flew a little further and I said, Lord, uh, what about that need I have in Africa? He said, when you get to Tulsa at the end of your meeting, call a man up. And he told me what was, this man was going through. He said, call him up and he said, put $500 in your briefcase and give the briefcase and the $500 to the man. I said, okay. So I had to take everything out of my briefcase, just leave it in the airplane. And I put $500 in there in an empty briefcase. And I'm talking about a nice briefcase. 
It was an alligator briefcase that was a gift to me. So I flew a little further and the Lord said, I said, Lord, what about my need? He said, when you get to Tulsa, I said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I knew what was coming. He said, you just bought two vans for your ministry. There's a couple in the service. They'll be in the service tonight that have a ministry of uh, providing food for the poor in their community and they need a new van. Give them one of your new vans. So notice every time I brought up a need, God brought up a seed. I said, when I brought up a need, God brought up a seed. See, we're need minded. He's seed minded. Amen. So when we got to Tulsa, I called up those five preachers and this is a minister's conference. There was 2000 preachers in there. And I said, there are five preachers here. And I told them what the Lord said. And five men came up out of the audience who were on the verge of leaving the ministry. And I told them what the Lord said. And wouldn't you know it? Every one of them were my size. Not a tall one in a bunch. I said, as soon as I get home, I'll send you a suit. Give me your address. I'll send you a suit. And I said, and I want, uh, the Lord told me to add this. When you put on my suit, I have a spirit of longevity and you will never leave the ministry. And I said, now there's a man in here. And I told what, I said, come on up. And the man came up that identified with that situation. And I said, the Lord told me to give you my briefcase and $500. And then I said, there's a couple in here that, that's in need of a new van. Yours is worn out. You have a ministry of distributing food to the poor in your community. I just bought your van. Come on up here and uh, let me lay hands on you. And if you'll come to Fort Worth, I'll present you with your van title and keys and I'll fill it up with gas before you leave town. So then I preached and I got on my airplane and I flew home. You would have think, you would have thought when I got in my airplane, Zowie, it'd been full of money. <laughs> just laying on the floor, falling out of the vents. No, not a thing changed for me, but things changed for them. Yeah. Amen. But that following Monday, we started the Believers Convention here in Fort Worth. And uh, after the service, the, the first night service, a bunch of us were in the elevator going to our room. And there was a lady that came into the elevator. Didn't look like she'd been to the meeting. She didn't have a Bible. She didn't have a purse. She was in a jogging suit. It looked like just a guest in the hotel. May have just been, you know, uh, gone to dinner somewhere in Fort Worth, downtown. And she got on the elevator, pushed her floor, and didn't say a word to us, and just rode up until it opened the door opened to her floor. We're all standing in there talking. And she stopped and turned around and said, Brother Jerry, God told me this would happen. Reached in her pocket, gave me a check, and the door started closing almost before I could say thank you. And I had this check in my hand. Inquiring minds want to know. I opened it, and it was exactly what I needed to finish that project. Praise God. Whenever you have a need, God's way is so a seed. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Amen. That's God's way. It was God's way from the beginning. Seed time and harvest shall not cease. It's God's way now. You can find it in Genesis. You can find it in Mark. You can find it in Galatians. Why? Because it is a principle that will never cease. Hallelujah. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. And if you read this story in Exodus, the Bible uh, talks about all that they sowed and all that they did. And then they... They began to prepare the work. And when they finished the work, here's what God rewarded them with. The sanctuary was filled with the presence of God. Filled with the glory of God. Hallelujah. Filled with His power. Filled with His goodness. Filled with His presence. Hallelujah. That was the reward for them sowing before they ever completed the assignment. Amen. I'm believing for the same thing. I said, I'm believing for the same thing. Hallelujah. This is the first night of First Things First Conference. And we've been telling you that we wanted you to come tonight prepared to sow a seed to start your year sowing a seed. And obviously the seed is going to go into 
our building program. Just like that seed went into the building program that Moses was heading up. And they brought their seed. And they brought it willingly. In fact, there's one place where it says they brought so much, Moses had to stand up and say, it's enough, don't bring any more. I haven't, I haven't said that yet. When we get there, I'll tell you, praise God. Amen. They were willing to sow their seed. And as a reward for their obedience, for applying God's way of doing things, He filled the place with His glory, His presence, His power, and His goodness. Can you say amen? amen. So I'm expecting that. I believe beginning tonight and the rest of this conference and the rest of this year and right on in to when we complete that project, that our reward is going to be the presence of God like we have never experienced before. Amen. Hallelujah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be... Uh, uh, it's going to be like a dinner bell ringing to this entire community. Come and get in the presence of God. Come to heritage. The, the presence of God is there. The glory of God is there. The power of God is there. The goodness of God is there. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout in advance for it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, uh, did we put that little video together? I, wanted, I want you to see what your seed is going to tonight. It's, it's part of the building program. But before, and, and Justin just gave me this morning some of the plans that, uh, that have been redone for the third time, I think. And so I don't want to present those to you until I haven't had a chance to sit down with him and go over them because he just brought them to me this morning. But it's looking good. But, hold on. But in the meantime... We're, we're building warehouses and storage buildings because you never have enough room for storage in a church. We got stuff stored all over this place. We got buildings outside stored with, uh, with, with, with equipment and tables and all that. And, and we are almost finished with a building. There's three buildings down there. Two of them are finished. And this third one is a storage facility strictly for Heritage of Faith Christian Center. And it's, it's in the process of being finished. So this is what your seed's going to go into tonight because it's still part of the building program. All right, now, let's show that video. If you've been watching along West Cleburne Road, you have seen our newest building going up. The building is 48 by 75 feet and will be used exclusively for our heritage storage. It is 3,600 square feet of temperature controlled storage space with three 25 by 48 foot bays with easy access 10 by 18 garage doors. It will house our heritage train in the winter months as well as all of our general and seasonal storage. It has a beautiful facade with a glass storefront and porch. The building is almost complete and will be ready for moving our storage by mid-February. This will open up space in our current modular buildings for offices, classrooms, discipleship space, and growth. We are advancing, we are progressing, and we will see our highest expectations fulfilled. Amen, let's give the Lord a praise for that. Now the other two buildings are for Jerry Savelle Ministries International. And one of them uh, is housing all of our Chariots of Light trucks and trailers and equipment that we use uh, for rallies and tours and all of that. And, and it's, it's full. <laughs> and uh, the other is, is, is uh, filled with, with equipment that we can do maintenance on our own vehicles and so forth. And then the other one is storage that, that we've moved from the headquarters over to that storage building. But this one will be strictly for Heritage of Faith. Amen. Everything that it needs, the youth department, everything that it is needed for storage will go in that building. Praise God. So, and by the way, we've paid cash all the way. We've paid cash all the way. Amen. And we're about finished, so let's, let's sow our seed tonight. And 
you've heard me say this before. I never ask people to do something I'm not willing to do myself. So I'll start it. I got my seed right here. I'm sowing ten thousand dollars. And so this is personally from from me and Carolyn that we're sowing because this is the way we live. We learned his ways. 55 years ago and we're still practicing his ways today and his ways are perfect hallelujah now there's some things i'm believing for and this is how i have acquired everything i've ever believed for is i sowed a seed first and as long as the earth remains i will keep doing that because it's god's way can you say amen did did i make that clear to you tonight amen it's god's way of doing things so let's uh, prepare. And if you'll notice in the Bible here in Exodus, it said, bring an offering. Bring an offering. I, I, I don't know. There's just something about bringing an offering. It seems like it, it uh, stirs your faith. Amen. So, uh, Danny and the group, if you're sowing, would you guys be the first to sow and, and then come up and and prepare to lead us in praise and worship. And uh, guys, we need some containers up here. Ushers, if you'll bring some containers. I'm sorry I didn't prepare you ahead of time. But uh, uh, if you'll just lay them here on the altars. Okay. On both sides. And if somebody might be able to move this for me, please. Please. So I'm believing with you in Jesus' name as the apostle of this church, as the founder of this church, I'm believing with you in Jesus' name that your seed is going to produce maximum harvest. Maximum harvest. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God is able to do exceeding, abundant, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that work within us. Amen. So He's the God that is more than able to cause your harvest to come back to you multiplied many times over. Amen. No farmer goes out and plants a seed and then at harvest time expects to get one crop back, one seed back, one apple back, one tomato back. He expects it to have multiplied. Amen. Amen. This is what God did with His Son, Jesus. He sowed Jesus and He reaped a family. Hallelujah. So I'm praying in Jesus' name that as you sow your seed tonight, putting first things first, that it is going to set the stage for the year that you're going to have. A marvelous year, a year of progression and advancement and promotion. Highest expectation being fulfilled in Jesus' name. And if anybody will agree with me, give the Lord your best shout. Praise God. Amen. So Danny, go ahead and let's worship the Lord. And as we do, you just come on and bring your seed.
pray over these. I know you watching by way of internet and you sowed as well. I know some you may not have brought something up, but you may have given by, by a text to give or in the church center app. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Mm. Oh, praise you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Oh, thank you, Father. That seed is holy seed. We don't take anything that we do for the kingdom of God. We don't take it for granted. As a pastor under Dr. Savell that has been placed in this position, Father, we don't take any seed that has been sown for granted because sowing seed is a spiritual law. It means it's holy. So, Father, as a minister and authority in this house, we receive this seed. And it's going to go into building a kingdom building that will bring about kingdom in this area, in this community. Thank you, Father. And so, seed, I speak to you. If Jesus could speak to a fever and it said the fever obeyed him. Seed, you can obey me. And so as they have sown in obedience and they have sown in faith and they have sown in an attitude of honor. Seed, you go forth and produce in the lives of those that have released you today. They have released you by faith, and they have let go of the seed into the kingdom. And I thank you, Father, that the kingdom is God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So, Father, I thank you that seed go forth and produce. Go forth and bring forth promotion. Go forth and bring 30, 60, 100-fold maximum harvest. Father, we thank you for maximum harvest over this seed. Hallelujah. We join our faith and add our faith that this is a year of progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion, and seeing their highest expectation fulfilled. Lord, I thank you for bringing about promotion in their lives, bringing about breakthrough in their lives. Thank you, Father. Increase, increase. You said that those that would, would worship and fear the Lord, both small and great, that you would increase them more and more, them and their children. Woo. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Lord, and I thank you that this is a seed of thanksgiving. This is a seed of praise. Hallelujah. That giving is not just, just a, of sowing seed, but it's also, it is also something that we are, we are praising God with. Hallelujah. And I thank you that our praise puts the hand, our hand on the neck of the enemy. Hallelujah. And I thank you that these seeds that have been sowed in faith, I thank you, is breaking the, the neck of the enemy over their lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We rejoice in the increase. We rejoice. Hallelujah. In seeing your presence. As it said in Exodus, it said when, when Moses finished all the work, it said the glory of God fell. And we thank you for all that we're going to see take place in this house and through our lives in 2024. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.
Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We rejoice, Lord. We rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice in your faithfulness. We rejoice. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We glorify you. We magnify you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Whoo. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Carmen, can you come up here real quick? Hallelujah. Carmen is going in for a procedure on her esophagus. Mm. Thank you, Father. Mm. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Mm. Mm. Make everything whole. Restore, restore, restore in every way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Restore in every way. Restore, restore, restore. Restore in every way. Woo. Mm. Thank you, Father. Restore, restore, restore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just place your hand on the person, your left and your right, and just speak restore over them. Restore over them. Hallelujah. Restore that which is broken. Restore that which is out of joint. Restore. 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 Hallelujah. Restore. Restore. Hallelujah. Restore. Hallelujah. Restore. Restore. Make new. Hallelujah. Make alive. Quicken. Quicken. Hallelujah. Quicken. Quicken. Hallelujah. Quicken. Make alive. Strengthen. Equip. Empower. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for it, Father. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Did you have anything else, Dr. Savell? Hallelujah. Mm. So you receive this tonight? Amen. Thank you, Father. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. I'm expecting great things. Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. It's going to be good. It's going to be real good. R real good. Say it's going to be real good. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the word that we heard tonight. And we just thank you for your presence that is on each one of us. And as we leave tonight, I thank you that presence will, will go with us, would surround about us, and keep us in every way. And I thank you, Lord, throughout tomorrow, we will be praying in the Spirit. We'll be seeking you. And as we come together tomorrow night, I thank you something glorious. Something glorious will happen in our midst. And we will see your glory in amazing ways. We will see your power in amazing way. We will see your presence in amazing way. And we will experience your love in an amazing way. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bring somebody tomorrow night with you. And don't forget, go give them Jesus.